Camille, this is the first talk of 2012. I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year. Um, this is our 10 year anniversary of the campus, so we're kind of excited. Um, talks happens nearly every Tuesday, talks on computer systems. Several of them are co-branded as um, large systems service systems, which this is one of those talks. This is an attempt to bring part of the community together to look at the technical and social aspects of large service systems that are increasingly supported by systems like that. Um, more information can be found on the website. We're also recording things on Adobe Connect for those who are connected remotely. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm supposed to make a very short introduction, but to fill up enough time until the technical glitches are resolved. <clears throat> so it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Rafi Krikorian. He's Director of Application Services Group at Twitter. All of you know Twitter. Uh, Rafi and I talked over lunch whether I should introduce him as someone, here's someone who needs no introduction, but he's going to have an introduction anyway. Um, his team manages, amongst other things, the business logic, scalable delivery, API authentication of Twitter's applications. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that I thought was most interesting, he was talking about things he did before, which was uh, personal energy management relative to global energy management. You know, you could tell how much energy you're using. I like this building off the wall projects company. I'd like to hear about that. And um, most interesting is while he was uh, in, in the Cambridge area, he says he spent way too much time as a student at MIT and MIT Media Lab, probably hard to get out. And I think Ted, and Ted may be responsible for that. Right. So with that, I'll hand over to Rafi. Are we sort of in business? Ten, nine, eight. Great. Our computer's wonderful, huh? And there we go. Perfect. Thank you, Rafi. Uh, hey, how's it going? So uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Like you said, my name is Rafi Kukori, and I'm the director of a group that we call Application Services at Twitter. Um, so um, how many of you know what Twitter is? <laughs> that is a pathetic hand raise. Um, so, so what my group does effectively is if you think of all of Twitter, if you think of, if you try to imagine what our data model is, so we sort of deal with users, we tweet, deal with tweets, and we deal with timelines, my group runs all the scalable logic around those three nouns. So effectively my team runs the nouns and the verbs of Twitter. Uh, so following, unfollowing, DMing, uh, tweeting, all that sort of runs through the scalable infrastructure that my team runs. Uh, there's something like 125 million active users on the Twitter system right now. Uh, and they generate something on the order of 400,000 requests a second come through my team's infrastructure. So we need to run all the scalable delivery mechanisms of Twitter as well as the scalable ingest mechanisms of Twitter. And then the way we sort of think about it is that all the other product teams sort of build on top of my team's core infrastructure. So they, for all effective purposes, they make it look pretty. Uh, so we can sort of leave it at that. So what I wanted to do was so I'll give a brief uh, overview, and uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time, of how we sort of think about uh, engineering for real time at Twitter. So that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But so this is sort of the um, inception of Twitter. This is Jack's first sketch of what the Twitter system should look like on a notepad he did a couple of years ago. Um, and since then, we've clearly evolved to a much more complex and interesting system. We're no longer just a website. You, we're no longer just this Ruby on Rails app that people sort of think of Twitter as. Um, and instead, we run this scalable delivery network that the entire world taps into, and we try to deliver messages as quickly as possible to the world's infrastructure. Like, I have this interesting position that every time someone tweets, I exert pressure on the internet in some way, because a single tweet may generate hundreds of emails, SMSs, push notifications. Sort of like every time something comes through a Twitter or infrastructure, we sort of exert uh, some kind of stress onto the rest of the world. So this is what the world views Twitter now as. It's sort of this information discovery network. And so people can find and share information either through people they already know or they can follow arbitrary people through the internet. Um, so the, the example that I like to lead with, this is the USGS report of 
the earthquake that happened on the East Coast around the Washington, D.C. area. And this is the first tweet that sort of showed up about it. About 42 seconds after the earthquake was recorded, the first tweet sort of showed up and was broadcast to the world, sort of explaining, you know, there's something going on here right now. Um, and if we look at the map, so this is, again, from the USGS account. Uh, this is the the um, the earthquake heat map, effectively, of that area that the uh, that the earthquake was centered at. And of course, the the radius that the earthquake propagates is bigger than that, or it goes onto a domain that sort of looks like this. It can be felt all the way in New York, can be felt all the way in Boston. And what what I like to lead with is that so for that distance um, of about 300 miles, at a 40 about 42 seconds after the the earthquake first hit, the tweet was sent, means that the tweet was the tweet was received in the New York and Boston area before the P waves are traversed that distance. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this interesting phenomenon going on that, that we can really get into a world where information is propagating faster than we can physically feel the world shake and move around us. And this is also immortalized in this great comic strip, sort of envisioning the exact same thing. Um, of course, my, my favorite frame is the last frame. Uh, that the instinct of all Twitter users is not necessarily to run for cover and these kinds of things. Uh, in fact, there's a there's a great sign in the Twitter office in the firewall saying, "In case of fire, stop tweeting." Uh, so, but Twitter also is not just this global network, but it's also a very personal one. So this is the coffee shop that's around the block from where I live in Oakland. And they tweet every Saturday morning whenever the scones come out of the oven. Mm -hmm. So I can use it very much as my own personal information network of how do I know when to get out of bed? Because I really only want to go if they have warm scones waiting for me. Uh, and this continues in so many other domains. My wife was stranded in London when the volcano was going on in Iceland. And the only way she could figure out how to get an available flight to come out was to actually follow the American Airlines and the British Airways Twitter account to see what the status of the planes were and whether Heathrow was letting anyone fly at that given time. And that's the only way she made it home for Christmas. Um, there's also examples of the Hurricane Irene. So when, when, that was, when that was sort of traversing its way through the East Coast, all the major news agencies were setting up Twitter feeds to be either their reporters on the ground who are disseminating information or just telling you, like, I-80 might be closed right now. You may want to take a different route or the current prediction path puts a hurricane right straight through Fifth Avenue going up to Manhattan. Um, so Twitter is being used as this great way to sort of like equilibrate how we disseminate information in the world. But the key thing is that we, we need to do it in this, what we call the real-time constraint. So everything that we send on Twitter has to get out in a couple of seconds. We don't have the luxury of waiting minutes. We don't have the luxury of waiting hours in order for a message to propagate through. So everything we've built has been so we're predicated on the fact that we're one of the few companies, aside from um, financial industry, that actually needs to deal with uh, information getting out at the instant it's actually been created and generated. So that leads to a, a slew of interesting problems for us, uh, little, not just on message delivery, but also relevance, relevance matching engines in real time is a very hard problem for us. And the inverse of that, which is spam filtering, becomes a very hard problem for us. Like we can, it's a very uh, almost impossible problem for us to catch spam at the time that it's created. So we necessarily have a asynchronous path that catches it a couple seconds later. So there's always that race condition that someone may have seen this piece of content that the spam engine may have come and cleaned up after the fact. So to describe the engineering challenge, I just sort of want to focus on so what what is a tweet? You know, it's 140 characters. Uh, the reason for 140 characters is mostly historical. Uh, for, in SMS in the United States, it's limited to 160 characters. So we have tw about 20 characters reserved for the username that creates a tweet, and then the rest of it for the text itself. Actually, historically, when Twitter was first created, the amount of your the amount of co the amount of characters you can use for content was dynamic to pace depending on your username length. So if you're lucky enough to have a one-character username, you can actually have a little more longer tweet. Uh, we've since eliminated that rule to sort of like make it a little more fair for the rest of the world. So a tweet is 140 characters max. And then we have this, uh, what we call the asynchronous follower graph. So the verbs, that, the, the descriptions we use here is that one person follows another person and another person is followed by that person. And the reason we do this is sort of this allows you to express, we think, 
interest a lot better than you can in a bi-directional social network. So for example, this is one of the managers on my group, uh, Dana Contreras, she goes by Dana Danger. Uh, so Dana Danger and I follow each other because there's a mutual relationship there. Like I would yell at her in my staff meetings if she did not follow me back. But in, in the case of the rest of the world, it gets a lot more complicated. Like a lot of people follow each follow people that don't necessarily have their reciprocal relationship back. So some good examples of it is I might follow the president. He sadly doesn't follow me back. I might follow Lance Armstrong. He sadly doesn't follow me back. But what I'm expressing through that relationship is sort of the interest model. I I care about what the president might have to say. Uh, I may be interested in politics. For whatever reason, I'm, I care about what the president has to say. I also care about cycling because I follow Lance Armstrong. The bi-directional relationship sort of doesn't muddy that, that interest graph that we're sort of curating through a Twitter system. So these, this, is the main, this is the main thing about Twitter, is sort of maintaining this graph in a way that we can propagate messages through it. So every single tweet that's created needs to then follow through through that follower following relationship. So just a brief level high, high level overview for those of you who don't know how Twitter might work. So a single tweet that's created, uh, it gets pushed through the Twitter infrastructure and all it has to do is uh, fan it out to everyone who might be following Dana Danger. So she created the tweet, I follow Dana, I get that tweet to my timeline and anyone else that's following gets a tweet in their timelines also. So at a high level, this is literally all that the Twitter infrastructure has to do. Um, and then what I, sort of what I like to ask is like, that sounds really easy, but of course that's our biggest trick question. And it's a trick question for many reasons. One of them is that real-time constraint, I'll go into it in a bit, and one of them is just a pure scalability problem for us. Like I was saying before, it's 125 million active users. Pumping that much content through our network is very um, difficult. It's sort of what keeps me up at night. So if we sort of analyze this a bit further, a single tweet, single tweet I said before is about 140 characters. 140 characters comes out to something like 200 bytes on average. And the reason for that is, is for, like this is not just even the metadata, this is just pure textual inf information that comes along with it. And the reason for that is mostly around tweets like that. Uh, so we have to deal with Unicode character encoding all the time because it means that it's well allowed the rest of the world to communicate through the system. So uh, we, we count for characters and not necessarily bytes that are transmitted through the system. Um, the reason I like this particular tweet is it's actually sent by an astronaut on board the International Space Station. Um, and the picture he associated with it is sort of a picture he took of Tokyo, of Tokyo Harbor as they were flying over it. So uh, it, it's just one of those moments where you realize that astronauts are also tweeting that sort of tickles my brain. Um, but so we have those 140 characters, uh, comes out to about 200 bytes. Again, this still might seem like a really small problem. So uh, I get this all the time whenever I lecture at systems classes. They're like, I could run Twitter on a server if that's all I'm pushing. But the one critical number that I haven't said yet is that we have to push something like 250 million tweets a day through the network. Um, that comes out to something like, if we take 250 million, comes out to about 2,900 tweets every single second at steady state that needs to run through a system. Twitter does this really interesting thing where we actually go through a sinusoid every single day, actually it's a double sinusoid, every single day on the traffic that sort of hits us. So right now we're past what I call peak. Peak for us happens around 10 a.m. Pacific time. 10 a.m. Pacific time is that weird confluence of time zones. So people on the west coast are going to the office. Uh, so that's LA, San Francisco, Seattle. Uh, people in New York are having lunch. New York is in the same time zone as Brazil, so people in Rio are going to lunch at the same time. People like to tweet in that time zone. Um, it's also around the same time that people are going to have uh, drinks in London, so people are drunk tweeting in London. And it's around the same time that people are going to bed in Tokyo again, so people are saying goodnight. So 10 o'clock in the morning is around where, I, where we hit our primary peak every single morning on Twitter. And in fact, the biggest ones happen on Monday and Thursday, just to, to finish out the story, probably because Monday is when people are talking about um, what they did last weekend, and Thursday is what they're talking about what they're doing next weekend. And that sign you sort of dips down as you sort of zoom over to Pacific. So you get over, you get over Hawaii, and people aren't tweeting in Hawaii as much. But it picks up again as you sort of get over Japan, Hong Kong, Indonesia, the Philippines. That's where our secondary peak shows up. 
And then it'll zoom down again if you go over to Middle East and back up again once the sun hits um, the sun hits Europe. So that's how that's what the real Twitter system looks like. 2,900 tweets a second is still a pretty impressive number in my mind. That means at steady state, 2,900 people in the world every single second of every single day. This is post spam filtering. This is post everything. So these are unique users every single day, every single second of every single day are sending about 2,900 pieces of unique content to the system. The burst rate looks somewhere around five to 6,000 tweets a second on the top of the peak. Uh, so we can see that. So that's, that's a very interesting question. So like if you look at the top of the sinusoid, that comes out to around 5,000 tweets a second these days. Um, that's also pretty remarkable. Um, if you think of it, when I started at Twitter, we were nervous when it hit 300 tweets a second. These days, if it ever dips to 300 tweets a second, something broke somewhere in the system. So that's when the that's one of your oh god moments. But the burst the burst situations are even worse than that. So that's those are still pretty much at um, what what is follows the standard curve. I have a few slides. I think I'll get to in a second of what burst really looks like. So this is Women's World Cup of last year when Japan won the Women's World Cup. The birth rate there hit about 7,200 tweets a second that came through at the, at the last second of the game. And you can see this is a graph of what I call TPS, tweets per second. And you can see the graphs are leading up to that peak that I've highlighted there. And every single one of those other peaks are other events going on in the game. Those are other shots on goals. Those are bad calls made by refs. Uh, those are a halftime that might be going on. So what's actually happening in the game is being reflected in Twitter in a lot of ways. The second peak you see there is actually because there was a second soccer game happening simultaneously in Peru at the time. So they were showing up as a secondary peak there. Another good example of a peak, this is New Year's of 2010 slash 2011. I didn't have, I didn't generate what 2011, 2012 looked like. But each one of those circles that I'm highlighting there is a major city, and the size of the circle is the amount of tweets per second they were generating. So I was saying before that Twitter follows this interesting sinusoidal pattern. <coughs> this is the one time of the year that Twitter changes that pattern. And on New Year's Eve, you see a sort of a peak every hour on the hour as sort of the world rings in New Year. So again, it's one of those where you can really see what's going on in the world is being reflected in the Twitter system in some way. Uh, tweets per second. So sure. How many users are tweeting per day? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know that off the top of my head. Twitter is mostly thought of as a consumption mechanism these days. So it follows like either the 90-10 rule or 95-5 rule, depending on how you think about it. Um, so the majority of our users aren't actually tweeting. The majority of our users are people who are coming and logging into Twitter.com and viewing tweets and seeing what's going on in the world. In fact, that number probably undercounts the number of people who are Twitter users. So I sort of think of all of you as Twitter users at some point if you just watch television. So like CNN, doc, the CNN weirdly reads tweets on the air uh, whenever breaking events happen. If you watch the Grammys or you watch the Video Musical Awards, there's a Twitter board going on behind the screen. If you watch the X Factor, they have a Twitter analysis screen going on just watching like whether or not the judges are being popular at any given moment. So in fact, like the, the television viewing audience or any media viewing audience is a Twitter user right now in some way. And we're only counting those that actually come and log on to the site and take a look for themselves what's going on. But because we believe in this like vast dissemination of information, everyone is weirdly a Twitter user. If you sort of drive to Tahoe and you look at those signs saying the snow conditions, well, those signs are tweeting. Uh, like they actually tweet out onto the network. So like you're all Twitter users if you're just driving on a highway, um, which is kind of an oh, interesting place to also be. This used to be one of our biggest uh, burst events, about 8,800 tweets. And when Beyonce announced that she was pregnant on the Video Music Awards, um, imagine trying to explain to a bunch of uh, software engineer nerds who Beyonce is, and you can understand the paradox in this picture. But, but I'm kind of wondering what about that's interesting. Uh, I think the vast majority of people who listen to popular music find that very interesting. But will it change her career? Possibly. Yeah, I mean, like, I think her being pregnant actually will vastly change her career. I think she uses can use that as a as a media marketing event, and I think all the people who are sort of 
who have watched and commented about it, and if you just think of my 95-5 rule I just said, clearly are interested in what she's doing right now. So I think this is, a, for anything, this is a validation for her of how popular she might be. This is some measurement of that kind of popularity. Our current record for burst events, and I'll, I'll stop dwelling on this for a sec, is um, the castle in the sky showing in Tokyo of around December of last year. Somehow the television announcer convinced everyone when one of the characters said a very specific word, they should all tweet. Um, <laughs> and they unfortunately did. And the site took about 25,000 TPS at that exact moment. But there are clearly a lot more other interesting things that happen in the network <laughs> than just those type of events. But those are the kind of magnitude of events that we need to deal with on the Twitter infrastructure. Like we need to be able to ingest and distribute all that data. So, uh, yeah. Uh -huh, I was about to get to that. So we don't tell, ex we don't, ex yeah, so. The mics are all on, on front of you. In fact, I'll you just, just repeat lean it. towards them. They, 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 if, if you rattle your keys in front of them, everyone will notice also. So, so let me just repeat the question for those. Just, who, just look at this black microphone as you talk. So what's the average fan out of a tweet itself? We don't actually give out what that fan out number looks like, uh, but you can, you can easily envision it. It's probably somewhere in the order of like, for if, I, if you follow the 95.5 rule, it's probably in the order of 100 right now. So every single time one of those people tweet, 100 copies of that message might need to be po propagated through the network. But let me, let me go through this for a second. So just knowing that scale, so knowing that we want to be able to deliver messages in seconds, not minutes, knowing that we need to push something like 250 million tweets a second out, and there's an average fan out rule that we need to deal with, what does sort of the Twitter architecture look like? How do we think about, how do we think about building that type of system? So before, uh, when I first joined Twitter, Twitter was a monolithic Ruby on Rails app. So we embarrassingly run the world's largest Ruby on Rails site right now. Uh, but we've been rapidly evolving our architecture to get away from that to allow for scalability to occur in, in much more controlled ways. When you, uh, for those of you who may run a Ruby on Rails site, so when you get to the size of Twitter, scalability gets a little out of control and you just are stuck literally throwing hardware at the problem. And the problem is that because you run a monolithic app, you just you are attempting to just continuously uh, horizontally scale um, homogeneously as opposed to actually just trying to figure out what the root of the problem might be and scaling up that portion of the service a bit more. So given Dana Dangerous tweet, what might actually happen? So the first thing that happens is that a single API client, whether it be our web client, whether our mobile client, calls an API that we call status update. Status update is what actually allows you to commit a message into the Twitter infrastructure so we can figure out what to do with it next. The first thing that will do is it calls a system we call Snowflake. So every single one of the tweets that are sent through the Twitter network have a unique ID associated with it. The unique idea is a couple of contracts that we manage with the ecosystem. Um, this is the first time I'm probably using the word ecosystem. We have about 1.2 million API clients right now, 1.2 million unique API clients talking to a Twitter infrastructure right now. Uh, those are things from a my mobile phone, the Twitter, the Apple iOS 5 integration, to television shows, to the Salesforce integration. So it sort of runs the gambit. Uh, it's plants that tweet when they're thirsty. It's ovens that tweet when, when things come out of them. So there's about 1.2 million of those. So we work very hard to make sure we maintain backwards compatibility at all times so we don't break any one of these clients. Just the communication burden on running our network and communicating with all these developers is hard enough already that if I told them they all need to change their code, they would all shoot me. Um, so the first thing that we do when we generate a tweet is we call Snowflake. Snowflake will generate us a unique 64-bit ID for every single tweet, and we do this in a distributed, non-coordinated way across all the data centers. So this way we guarantee every single tweet has a unique ID, and we know exactly when it was created and where it was created, like down to which rack that, that tweet sort of came into. When I first joined Twitter, every single tweet was stored in one big MySQL table, um, and we used auto-increment IDs to generate the IDs of the tweets. And as you can imagine, for those who use MySQL, that breaks really quickly, probably around 300 inserts a second it breaks really quickly, no matter how much harder you throw at it. So this way it allows us to ask Snowflake for IDs. Snowflake can generate IDs up to around 100,000 a second these days. So we can get an ID and then stuff that back into the database. 
Um, we have open source Snowflake. If everyone, if anyone has a similar type of problem that we have, you're more than welcome to use that code. The next thing we do with this tweet is we call a system that we call RockDove. Uh, when I first built RockDove, the idea was to be able to locate every single user who's creating a tweet with some with some sort of caveats around that. So if a user allows themselves to be located, RockDub will figure out where they are. RockDub knows everything about the IP addresses in the world. RockDub knows how to decode uh, Foursquare links in tweets. So we can pull out a Foursquare link and then say like, oh, Silicon Valley, our CMU Silicon Valley is in California, not in Pittsburgh. So we can figure out that kind of stuff. As well as knowing if you sent your latitude and longitude with a tweet, RockDub knows a map of the world. So it can figure out and pin you on a map. We use this for lots of different reasons, right? So you can envision that someday, someday in the near future, Twitter might be sending you messages based on where you physically are at the given moment. And that's because RockDove can locate you to some certain bounds. We also use this for the X factor voting integration. So we only wanted to count the votes from people who are actually in the US. So we didn't want to have uh, counting occurring for people who happen to be in England watching show at any given time. So RockDove knows how to locate all those users. The next thing we do is we hit a system that we call Talon. So Talon sir, knows how to deal with every single URL that comes into Twitter and can wrap it in a Tico URL. So it's our URL shortener. Uh, every single URL that comes into Twitter gets wrapped and shortened to about 19 characters. We right now run the third largest URL shortener in the world and it's because of Tico. So every single tweet that comes in, we wrap, we can send out via SMS. We're trying to make it easier on users before users have to go to Bitly and shorten their links and stuff like that. Right now, Twitter will just take care of that all for you. So all this is happening in milliseconds after each other. All these are dedicated clusters are somewhere in the data center. So the, the central code that takes to, that does ingest of a tweet is now talking to every single one of these systems in rapid succession. So first it asks Snowflake. Snowflake returns in about four milliseconds. It asks RockDove. RockDove takes about 10 milliseconds. It asks Talon. Talon takes about five milliseconds. And then add network hop. So network hop is maybe two, two milliseconds, give or take. So we're talking a couple of milliseconds to sort of sweep through the data center as a tweet comes in. And then what we need to do is we hit storage. And for storage, we have a system that we call Thunderbird. So Thunderbird is a way that we've abstracted away MySQL for the entire data center. So given a tweet, uh, given a tweet, Thunderbird will then stuff it into multiple copies of MySQL throughout the data center and throughout the world. So we, we are planning for the time that sort of Godzilla trashes through our data center and we have off-site replicas of every single one of the tweets so we can bring up Twitter again in a couple of seconds. So Thunderbird is managing this global distribution network of every single tweet that's coming into the data center in real time. So as tweets are flowing in, that 2,900 or 5,000 or 28,000 tweets a second coming in, Thunderbird is rapidly fanning that out through the entire world and through multiple machines in every single data center. So we have replicated storage. If we can get through all that, then we can finally return to the user. And what the user sees is an HDD 200. And they get this back in about 170 milliseconds. So for all they know, they've just committed to one single database. But we've managed to do a whole slew of computation throughout the data center and throughout the world in that 170-ish milliseconds as that tweet was just committed to the Twitter infrastructure. I call this the synchronous right path. So if for those of you who have been following along, this doesn't even account for fan out yet. So what do we do for fan out? So given the synchronous write path, we immediately send off to another system, to a slew of different systems. One of them is our streaming API. So if any of you have ever played with the Twitter developer APIs, you can hold a socket open to Twitter and in real time will blast out tweets to you. So if a tweet is created in about 150 milliseconds, you'll get a copy of that tweet out of that socket that you're holding open to us. Um, a few people in the world, about 20, 25 people in the world, have access to the full firehose of information. That's every single public tweet that's created on the Twitter network. Um, if you were to get access to that, you'd need to hope, oh, hold open a connection that's about 22 megabytes a second in order just to hold open the firehose that's coming slamming through your network. Um, so not very many people have that infrastructure that you can even ingest that amount of data. Although I've been working with a bunch of academic institutions to figure out how we can cascade fire hoses into different universities so that people can start sampling our data but better for research purposes. So the fire hose gives out all this information and just literally spews out all of Twitter's data. 
Another thing we do is we stuff it into our search index. So Twitter runs a very modified version of Lucene as a search indexer on a system that we call Early Bird. Everything at Twitter has a bird name somewhere. So Early Bird holds the corpus of all tweets and, is, and, is, and it's searchable by different characteristics, whether it be text by the person who created, whether the location they created about, or even the contents of the URL that you might have referenced inside the tweet. So every single time a tweet is sent through, the search index will, will fetch the URL, stick it into the data center, and then index that and provide that as another axis of which you can search tweets for. You said a very modified version of Lucene. Is it modified just for performance, or did you add new capabilities? It's, it's strictly modified for performance. We've open sourced all that code as well, so you can get it on the, on the Git Twitter GitHub page. Um, but it's strictly modified for performance. We can index a single tweet as it comes through in less than 10 seconds and have it searchable throughout the data center at the rate at which they're coming in. Uh, so the versions of Lucene before that just couldn't keep up with the speed that we're trying to shove data into its different uh, indexes. And is there an API to actually access the indices so you can find tweets corresponding to some sort of characterization? The search API right now uh, publicly exposes that index. So if you went to search.twitter.com, you should be able to see that. You sh you'll see the, the human readable version of that, and then there's the API that allows you to programmatically access it as well. So we run, like this arguably becomes the fastest uh, web indexer right now. Like very few people have the problem of needing to index every single tweet in real time as it's coming through. Even Google, when they had access to our firehose, weren't doing that. They would index tweets on a batch process in the background, but allow you to see a stream of tweets on their page. It was actually really cool. You could search for a term, you'd see all the Google matches of it, and then tweets would just sort of flow by, but they weren't yet in entering the search index. Whereas for the Twitter infrastructure, we actually index them all in near real time. The real question is how do we manage something like fan out though? So we've done all that, all that sort of gone by, we're like 150 milliseconds and 170 milliseconds into processing. Fan out is what I describe as being able to deliver all those tweets to every single person who cares about them. So one of the little known secrets about the Twitter infrastructure is everyone's timeline is stored in memory somewhere in the data centers. So if I, if I look for my home timeline, there is at least three machines in data centers that have my home timeline fully in RAM somewhere. And what we constitute as a delivery is sort of appending that tweet into that in-memory structure. So we, we obviously maintain replication for the fact that machines break all the time. At Twitter scale, there's at least two machines a day that are going out of commission. So we need to make sure we manage triple redundancy on the entire clusters, uh, on the Haplo cluster, which stores all timelines. So what Fanout does is given a tweet that comes in, we look in a system that we call Flock. Flock is our social graph database. Flock contains all the indices of given Rafi who follows Rafi, or given Rafi who does Rafi follow. So you can ask those type of queries to Flock and it'll return it to you in less than 100-ish milliseconds. And this is the crux of Fanout. So a tweet came in from Dana Danger. The Fanout daemons are gonna ask Flock who, are, who is following Dana Danger so I can start delivery to those people. And then the fanout daemon just literally iterates through that list and starts stuffing them into their timelines. Stuffing into timelines might mean that SMSs are triggered, might mean that emails are triggered, might mean that iPhones start ringing, Blackberry start ringing. But these are all the things that get triggered just on the instant that a tweet starts to get fanned out. There's a minor race condition here uh, also because fanout, as you can tell, can't happen instantaneously where we're exerting all this pressure onto different systems. So we run multiple copies of the fan out daemon. And if Lady Gaga, for example, tweets, her follower list is quite large. And iterating through the entire follower list, follower list becomes problematic. So those people on the, on the beginning of her follower list will get her tweet a couple seconds before people at the end of her followers get that tweet. So it's entirely possible that if I'm at the beginning, Rafi could get a Lady Gaga tweet before you do, for example. I could have responded to that tweet, and you could see my response before you saw the original tweet, because we're sort of parallel processing this and managing the queues in this sort of way. It's a single level fan out, right? It's not a cascade. We don't cascade. We do single level fan out. You said that uh, you could see the response before you actually tweet. So sure. Some people will. Did you guys do something to Correct that? Yeah. 
Not, I mean, that's the problem with running a real-time system. Like, we will have blasted that tweet, we will have blasted my response out to certain followers, most of my followers, before the fan of Damon will have blasted Lady Gaga's tweet to those followers as well. What we do do is if you come to the website and reload that after the fact, we will, what we call, re-repair the site. So we will then temporarily sort the timeline again to, for presentation purposes. But if you're getting tweets pushed to you instantaneously, then there's almost nothing we can do there. We don't, we're not in the business of holding up tweets. Holding up tweets puts us on a very slippery slope. Because if we held up tweets for this potentially inconsequential issue, does that mean we're going to hold up tweets for other things, or censorship issues, or quality issues? So we're, we're not in that business at all. We'll just blast out tweets in real time as we get them and not, and not worry about this minor risk condition. So it, it kind of it pays to be an early friend. It pays to be an early friend. <laughs> And, and uh, are the timelines as well mixed somewhere? Like, if once you're located, and all you need to put on the timeline, you need to locate the timeline. Yeah, so there's a hap there's what we call the haplo name node, and the haplo name node is what can find find the correct machine that the timeline is indexed upon. So that's what allows us to bounce through the data center pretty fast. So in some way, that's what makes up the majority of the Twitter system, is being able to pull off this and pull off deliveries onto this layer in less than a second. So we can, we can fan out every single one of these tweets through multitudes of different systems. This is, of course, only a 10,000-foot view. There's at least 45 different pieces of machinery that touch a tweet as it sort of flows through this network. And that can happen in less than a second as it just gets propagated through. We monitor and manage every single one of these pieces of machinery very carefully and, and independently. So we capacity plan for every single one of these. We have what we call core drivers and core metrics. So given what standard um, user growth looks like, like I know that January is usually a slow month, uh, I can then tell you how we should be scaling each one of these clusters independently of each other. So if users are growing on a certain uh, trajectory, then the user search cluster needs to grow on that certain trajectory. If tweets per second are spiking, for example, Super Bowl is coming up, we're all doing a massive planning at Twitter to make sure we can survive the Super Bowl. So if we know Super Bowl is coming up, I can tell every single piece of machinery that's tied off the TPS, tweets per second core metric, and then make sure that we're scaling all those pieces of machinery appropriately. When we were planning for X Factor, I knew that we wanted to plan for a certain number of votes per second. And then I could tell you every single piece of machinery that needed to be scaled up on that purpose. And then each one of these are independently monitored with their own on-call rotations with escalation paths. Like one of the differences about managing an on-time, real-time system is that you need to have an on-call and real-time instant response mechanism. So if fan out broke all of a sudden, there are 30 people who are going to be woken up in the middle of the night to figure out exactly why that broke and bring up a secondary cluster and do fan out again. It's not an option for Twitter to be down. Uh, the world, in a lot of cases, depends upon Twitter, not just for entertainment purposes like, like seeing that Beyonce is pregnant, but seeing for the fact that earthquakes are rolling through or seeing for the fact that hurricanes are coming through. People care and depend on the Twitter network. So our hardest job is not necessarily building the system, but also making sure that we can have a slew of nines of availability in, uh, of Twitter itself. So we want 99.9999999% availability to make sure that every single tweet that's sent is gotten through, every single tweet's getting through in less than a second, and the fact that no, nothing is falling over in, in the process of doing so. In the pipeline, is there a fear screen or fan detection? Yeah, so I left that out, this caricature view. So we do some very rudimental, rudimentary spam protection before we hit the storage layer, but that's extremely rudimentary. Like basically, we've characterized a certain set of users as being spammers, so we just know to block those out fairly immediately. Uh, and the system learns about the, those type of behaviors, and an offline process will classify users into that. But what we normally do is we run a secondary process that's not within the pipeline that will go and clean up the timelines. So if we detect that spam has occurred, we can then remove them from certain people's timelines. But the problem is doing that in real time is a computationally almost impossible problem. So we don't do that part in real time. We'll do that asynchronously and do it as close to real time as possible. So a tweet may have been sent to certain users. Um, but if they're not following by SMS, then it wouldn't be blasted to their phone. It's just when they pull up on Twitter.com, we may have removed it from their timeline. 
So it just follow up question. If there is a, a three digit a three letter agency ask Twitter to filter out potential tweets from terrorists, you guys cannot do it. Not right now. No, yeah, that's a byproduct of the way infrastructure works. We just like um, we run like in order to capacity plan for anywhere between 2,900 tweets a second to 28,000 tweets a second, we run the system in this very interesting state that certain parts of the machinery are redlining almost all the time, certain pieces of the machinery are not redlining almost all the time, and we just don't have the spare computational power as tweets are flowing through to do it in the critical path. We have plenty of spare power not in the critical path, but that wouldn't filter any tweets per se. You mentioned before you are in this uh, part of the tweet that will actually catch that. Yep. Uh, uh, how do you ensure that that doesn't translate into a DOS attack? On yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we have a bunch of heuristics around SpiderDuck. SpiderDuck is what we call our spider. Um, we have a bunch of heuristics around SpiderDuck to make sure we never fetch the same URL twice in a given time period. Otherwise, people are retweeting TechCrunch articles to sort of take down, to tech, uh, take down TechCrunch in the process. So we, we have certain windows that we actually only will fetch, let's say, a single unique URLs once an hour to make sure that we don't see uh, multiple problems. This does lead to problems with CNN.com, for example, because CNN might update URLs more frequently than once an hour. So we have a like, sampling resolution problem there when we fetch it, but that's not necessarily something we're concerned about. It becomes a little more problematic when you deal with um, like soccer games. The so soccer games change really quickly, or Actually, no. But then, the, when people care about the instant that changes, and if your sampling problem might miss that that step function that occurred. You mentioned that you keep all the timelines for all the users in memory. So, how do you balance that with having triple copies of every single user and all the time? I mean, this is the core business of Twitter. So we balance that by throwing money at the problem. Uh, we just buy, make sure we buy those machines. Like those machines have a crap load of RAM. Um, uh, and we have specially made machines just for those timeline clusters. And do you disable old accounts or limit the timeline? Yeah, so like I, when I say all the users, I actually only mean active users. So the active user number uh, quoted there is less than by some percentage the total number of people who created accounts on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So we don't have everyone who's created accounts on Twitter in memory at any given time, but we can recreate their their timeline if we had to, mm -hmm. and that. So right now, if you ask for my home timeline, if I logged in, I'm an active user, the Twitter infrastructure can return my home timeline about 45 milliseconds. Uh, if you were a non-active user and you weren't in cache, it might take 200 milliseconds, for example. I mean, in terms of, you've got this um, incredible, you know, torrent. Uh, yeah. I guess I shouldn't use that word. But um, uh, is, there, is there any legacy? Is there any sense in which the history of, of Twitter's, you know, kind of the, the Twitter archive, does it exist and what would it be used for? So the Library of Congress has had a fire hose and has the entire corpus of every single tweet that's been created. So they archive all, to, like we clearly have an archive, we've never dropped a tweet, or not to our knowledge, we've never dropped a tweet and we have a storage center that contains the entire corpus of Twitter. And we use that for a vast amount of analytics processes. But we've made sure that the Library of Congress has the full corpus and they have a fire hose that keeps it continuously updated uh, for the posterity's sake. So in case anything ever went wrong with Twitter, then you would have the full corpus of Twitter for exactly that reason. Like, Matt, what would it be like if like Martin Luther King tweeted, right? So like we never want to miss those type of events that you can't know at the moment, but you know like years later, I wish I knew what happened then. Is that accessible to academics? So I'm pretty sure there's an academic licensing agreement wow. around it from the Library of Congress. I don't know the exact details. From the Library of Congress. Yeah. Oh, not from you. Uh, we don't have an agreement for ex for historical data from Twitter itself yet, um, but we have agreements that allow for updates, so sort of fire hose and those type of things going forward. But the Library of Congress has agreements for historical content. I guess that was I know that some of the early adopters of Twitter have moved on to other things. Um, I don't know. Are you worried? Uh, be more specific. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, no, not really. Like they're like always going to be continuous fads and sort of like the alpha tech generation. Yeah. But like I'm not like you can see that the the base 
the what we call the active user growth and we watch the demographics of where it's being picked up around the world that's very healthy and very strong in fact it's it's strong enough that it makes me worried as an infrastructure guy so like no we're not concerned because like you've often seen many celebrities also leave and they come back and then leave again and they come back it's just one of those things that I'm not necessarily concerned about it are the various replicas essentially autom autonomic? In other words, can parts of the system run when other parts go down? Yeah, so, so fail gracefully. And 100 percent. So, like we've designed the system to be resilient against individual failures. So, if a portion of the system went down, the rest of it can probably take up the slack, or might just run in a degraded state. So, like if Rockta went down, we just might not be able to geotag a few tweets here and there. So, I'm not concerned about that. The search engine went down. Users might not be able to search, but when we bring search back up, we can shove the corpus through it again to make sure it indexes whatever it might have lost. So the whole system is run as independently from each other as possible. I'm getting a nudge. Sure. So just a few, just a few quick slides. So oh, that's a weird repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, so like I was saying before, there's sort of this follower following graph that we sort of need to manage. I've talked about, I've talked about the fan out problem, but just to put some concrete numbers on the screen, these are some of the statistics of the biggest users right now and how many followers we have to deal with. Um, yeah, you can ignore me at the bottom. But so like when Lady Gaga tweets, 18.1 million people around the world get a delivery. A vast, short, like a surprising number of those people are SMS deliveries. So you can think we are the second largest SMS generator in the US, I think, right now, uh, the whole entire Twitter infrastructure. Um, so that we need to be able to like ping every single one of those cell phones every single time Lady Gaga tweets it's, tweets out something. Um, so our biggest problem is this type of question: is that the fact that we, Lady Gaga has that's my biggest problem. She has 10,000 more followers than I do. But what it really means is we're sort of scaling the system for 10 to 7. There is no bound to our social graph. Uh, email has a hard limit in its RFC, although you can play games with mailing lists. Facebook has a hard limit on the number of people you can be friends and followers with. Um, Twitter has no limit on the number of people that can follow you. And we explicitly design for no limit. So every single one of our systems need to be able to take into account an unbounded social graph when it, when it sort of processes information, which also means that we have very careful alerts around all of this. If propagation takes too long all of a sudden, my team has to go in there and figure out a way to make it go faster uh, so that we can scale out and even for scale out for the 10 to the 8th when that shows up. So, so just based on what you're saying, why are you designing for such a small population? We're not designed for such a small population. So I'm not I'm not going to be able to finish my slides, but that's fine. So I'll just sort of stop here. Um, no, we are, we are designing the Twitter system to be able to handle half the world's population. Uh, we're designing the Twitter system to be able to handle every single cell phone right now in the world. So those are the limits that we sort of targeted towards. There's always a careful balance when you're doing software engineering at our scale of like, do I design the perfect system or do I design the system that needs to work right now? The way that my infrastructure team sort of works is we build a system that we know can last about a year and a half. Uh, because in the time it takes to build that, something else will be breaking. So we're just continuously rotating through the architecture, like making sure this can scale out and building version two of that. That broke next, okay, version three of that. We just sort of keep on going around. And every single time you rebuild one of those, new lessons are learned on how to build the next one better. Um, so at no point, Twitter never stops growing. I can't, I don't have time to build the perfect system. I sort of building the best system we can right now for the problem. How many MySQL databases do you have, and what's your plan beyond MySQL? Uh, I'm not going to say that exactly, but we have hundreds to say that. Uh, our plan beyond MySQL is like we've experimented. We've been very open with the fact that we've experimented with Cassandra as one storage mechanism. We're experimenting with multi-level hardware solutions, so like mixed SSDs and platters to figure out what's the best mix on that. So we, we have a multi-pronged approach, both on software on the cluster level and better hardware mechanisms to store to serve Twitter data. The problem is that Twitter for better or for worse, Twitter is uh, really hot in the most recent data and then sort of gets uh, colder as you go back. But every once in a while, these colder tweets pop up. So it's sort of like this two layer with random access problem. And so a lot of software solutions don't provide us a good way to do that over years of corpus data. So we're trying to build our way out of that problem. I was thinking more about the radio timeout. 
Uh, in front of me. Uh, uh, question is very short. How do you say CSL um, being different from Akamai? Because Akamai has a distributed. So Ak network. yeah, Akamai has a distributed they're, content they're distribution network. Model, but yep. I they, also, they also push as well. Sure. Uh, the, the problem is the real time constraint. So Akamai, if you try to expire something out of their network, might take hours in order to remove it from their distributed CDN. Whereas I don't have that option. If someone wants to delete their tweet, their tweet needs to get out of the network in seconds. Uh, so the, the biggest problem, the biggest differentiator between us and them is that real time constraint and just the speed at which we're updating it. People don't make changes to the Akamai network a couple thousand times a second. People make changes on the or like a single a single organization makes a push into Akamai once or a few times a day, and that's about it. And then they sort of propagate that out. Whereas every single time someone tweets, I need to globally propagate that to all our cache books. Yeah, the, I mean, my, well, the problem my objects sort of like vary in size as well because they might have URLs attached to them, which might be a photo, right. which might be a web piece of web content. It used to be that Twitter was only the 140 characters. But now the Twitter vocabulary has got richer. OK. Question. Uh, you know, Twitter is now so popular among research communities. A lot of universities, including maybe in Silicon Valley, have been doing a lot of research on Twitter data. Do you guys do any research like by yourself? Yeah. We definitely run our own research team internally. And what they do is a lot of relevance filtering, a lot of machine learning to figure out what's going on in the network. In fact, if you look at what we're calling new Twitter or new new Twitter, we have a whole pane that we call discovery. And that's sort of telling you what you might be interested in is going on within the Twitter ecosystem right now. And a lot of that is modeling what you're interested in and then doing real time matching against the Twitter, Twitter network to figure out what might have, what might also be interesting in the network right now and present it back to you. So that's where our research tendencies sort of focus. And then there's some on sort of like fraud prevention on the revenue side and stuff like that. I'll just to follow up on that, um, <clears throat> you see a lot of students here. What, what should somebody be thinking about? If, just a two part question. What should they be thinking about if they want a job at Twitter? Sure. And then what do you need? You know, here we are researchers at a university or other people in the world. What is something that Twitter would like from people outside of Twitter? Sure. So if, if you're interested in a job at Twitter, then you should come talk to me. Uh, but there are two types of things that we're mostly interested in. Right now, uh, on the infrastructure side, it's going to be um, raw systems engineering talent. Like how do you understand large systems? Is your intuition correct? And also a lot on sort of that, that um, relevance matching engines of just being able to understand in real time what's going on on the Twitter hose and being able to propagate that out. How can you tell a story from 2,900 tweets a second? Um, and then on the product side, we have a, clearly a lot of work to do on, on mobile UIs, on UX, uh, UX uh, HCI problems. I've often said the, the, the future of the Twitter interface is one that you don't see. It's because you sort of walk around and your pocket buzzes at the exact right moment with the exact right piece of content for you, whether it be in real time or fetched from the historical Twitter corpus. So like walking into a restaurant, I want the tweet from my best friend who was there a year ago with a picture of the steak he took saying, order this. So like those are kind of things that I should, Twitter should just be able to push out to you. But the things that we need are, from the research point of view, turn out to be a lot of that relevance question, but also a lot of information security problems. So like we, we are trying to enable the world to communicate. Like so Arab Spring, a lot of people argue is specifically from Twitter and Facebook and those type of networks that sort of enable that to occur. How can we better build systems to allow those people to safely communicate with the rest of the world and not sort of get into any kind of problems with their local governments? So like we've done a lot of work on on sort of like uh, certificate pinning to make sure that no one's injecting a certificate in the middle of an SSL conversation. But how can we make SMS more secure? How can we make our direct messages more secure? How can we sort of encrypt and own that communication channel so a user really understands what's going on there and is not concerned that someone might be f watching who they're following and what content they're consuming? Uh, great. Uh, the question you just raised with the Arab Spring, uh, I seem to recall it was like the State Department or Hillary. Hillary Clinton uh, asked you guys not to do a backup or something. That was about th two and a half, three years ago. Yeah. yeah. So have you guys solved that backup problem? Yeah. Now? Do a, like oh. at that two and a half, three years ago, Twitter would go down for regular maintenance, which is fine given most websites. Twitter doesn't go down for maintenance now. So like we serve, we serve explain it as like 
we need to swap out the wings of a plane while we're still in, in air in flight or swap out the plane with a rocket ship while we're still flying. So like we don't take the site down for maintenance anymore. We have to do everything while the system's online. It's one of the biggest challenges we have. Um, one question I was wondering about is, is there a place for uh, an anthropologist in, or a sociologist at a place like Twitter or even in, <laughs> in thinking about Twitter? Or is the stuff just so new that all of those people's studies are just Archaic. No, like I, I, I definitely think there's a place. Like I know people like Dana Boyd who does all her work just looking at Twitter data and understanding how people use it. We do a lot of our own studies just to understand. Like we're we're causing this sort of like emerging phenomenon in the social media space, and we're also desperately trying to understand exactly what we're doing. So the, what this what our researchers do is do field studies. Like one of them took a road trip across the U.S. and just met with random people as he drove around, asking them how they use Twitter, or how they interact with Twitter, just so we can get a better understanding of the system we're building and the phenomenon we're kind of causing in the world. It's one of those that is sort of going without necessarily our direct involvement. Question. There's a big buzz around Internet of Things. Sure. So you see Twitter being a potential platform for that. It's it's a whole different you know world that's going to change once that really sure. comes on board. So uh, we've we've often thought of Twitter as either human to human, human to machine, or machine to human communication, not necessarily machine to machine communication. That being said, like when I used to be a professor at NYU, like a bunch of my students created plants that tweeted when they were thirsty, right? So like there's this weird Internet of Things effect going on there of like sensors getting distributed to the house, and that house or the plants having a personality that exhibits itself through Twitter, so I can follow them. Um, so like there is there is work like that going on right now. What we try, what we're not necessarily um, enabling, although we're not preventing, also is people building these device-to-device -device communication channels over Twitter. There, there are just probably better ways to go do that. Although there are interesting, of, uh, interesting stories of people creating botnets that are controlled by Twitter. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the best way to go about that either. So, so I guess one more question, or and, and maybe maybe we should get one question from him and then one from. Student, I like to get uh, questions from somebody that hasn't asked a question. So, students, I want you to think of a question after after uh, Joy speaks, and then and then what we do after that is we go out into the hallway and, and harass him as long as he can stand it while we feed him sodas and cook. So, it's so just like being a student again. Cool things about the engineering side of the Twitter. Can you say a little bit more about the business model, like you know, how the Twitter is going to generate some revenue? Sure. I mean, so we have a whole promoted content suite right now on Twitter. So that means that any advertiser. Uh, can promote either a tweet or a user or a trend so that people can go and interact with it. Our business model is usually around a cost per engagement model. So as long as people are actually interacting with the content. So like if we promote, if Starbucks promotes a tweet, the the engagement model is determined by are people retweeting it, favoriting it, replying to it, or clicking to Earl's. And in fact, we then feed that back into the network so that if someone promotes a piece of content into the network and no one is actually interacting with it, we'll actually pull it from the network. It's more important to us that our users are happy than the advertisers are spending money on us. But why would they spend money on that? They can just register as a Twitter account and tweet. We do break some of the follower graph models if you are a promoted if you're a promoted provider. So one of the models you can think of is if you and I are tweeting back and forth about coffee, that Starbucks might inject a tweet into the middle of that conversation about about coffee, even though you and I are not following Starbucks per se. So like you can the promotion allows you to break the follower model. Is there any uh, any people that haven't got to speak that have some burning question? Thank you, Mr. Uh, how do you handle uh, ID theft? So the question is, how do we handle identification theft and identity? And the, I would guess the opposite is identity verification. So we actually have a whole verification program. So people who might be on, who might have a problem that they might get um, misrepresented or parody accounts or inflammatory accounts that might show up, that will go and verify the, the actual person and put a verified badge on their account. And that's that actually is a pretty long process. Like we actually. Have to actually call you, you need to provide us information that we can verify with diff different authorities to put that badge on your account. So that's how we do the verification part. How we deal with ID theft is honestly, we have an entire team whose whole job is to make sure that if that ever happens or gets a report of that, to shut down accounts very quickly and their root cause and exactly how they broke into the system, whether it was user error by bad passwords or whether it was actually a flaw in the system somewhere and then patch that problem. Um, 
we've often bantered around different models of doing two-factor auth or different things like that. Um, I have nothing exact to say in that domain yet, but we are actively thinking about that problem. Fantastically interesting space, fantastically interesting talk. Thank you so much. And I'm sure a lot of these people will be delighted to, to, to go outside with you and, and talk about it. I'd rather not talk around the podium because we try to keep this room uh, empty for the next thing that's going to happen. But thank you so much. Thanks. Okay.